It's not the fastest, it hasn't got the biggest payload, and it's now 49 years since the prototypes first flew. But in a world of hypersonics and AI, the Tomahawk cruise missile is still a weapon that keeps leaders of countries that might be on the receiving end of these awake at night. So why are they so feared, considering all the technological advances in detection, electronic warfare, and anti-missile systems? How does it fare after nearly 50 years of almost continuous development and over 2,350 have been used in active combat situations? The Tomahawk started out in 1971 as a US Navy project to see if it would be possible to launch a strategic cruise missile from a submarine, either from the existing but large missile tubes or the smaller torpedo tubes. Now, cruise missiles had been used with submarines before. The problem was that they had to be launched from the decks of the submarine, which meant that it had to surface and then set up a cruise missile for launch, all of which would take time and during this process, leave it vulnerable to attack. Launching the missile from underwater was seen as the best possible option, but it also needed a very long range, which ruled out a rocket engine to fit into the small size, the size of a torpedo, and a high efficiency turbofan would be used instead. But you can't launch a turbofan powered missile from underwater, so it would require a miniature solid rocket motor that would ignite once it had exited the torpedo tube. This would push it through the water to the surface and to about 100 meters into the air before the air inlet for the turbofan engine opened, the wings and tail fins popped out and the rocket motor fell off, allowing it to carry on for the rest of the flight. Two companies were given the contract to build and test prototypes for the proof of concept. These were General Dynamics and LTV. During these trials between 1974 and 1976, the LTV ZBGM-110A failed on two occasions, but the General Dynamics ZGBM-109A worked flawlessly, and General Dynamics won the contract. Although it was built by General Dynamics, much of the navigation technology was developed by the APL, or the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University, who had worked on advanced navigation systems since the 1950s as befits the US tradition of giving Native American derived names to weapons, it was assigned the name of Tomahawk, a well-known word for a compact, hard-hitting weapon, which fits the missile rather well. Its official name is the BGM-109 Tomahawk Land Attack Missile, or Talon. By 1980, a ship launch version was also being built, and by 1984, a nuclear ground launch version called the BGM-109G Griffin was being co-developed too. This carried a single W84 10 to 50 kiloton nuclear warhead. The US deployed 322 Griffin missiles aboard 95 TEL vehicles. However, after the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union came into force, that was to cover missile launchers with ranges of 1,000 to 5,500 kilometers, or 620 to 3,420 miles, the entire stock of Griffins were destroyed by 1991 in accordance with the treaty. Now, in a previous life, 25 odd years ago, I created several successful online businesses, all of which I hand coded from scratch using PHP, MySQL, and JavaScript, which I also learned as I went along. And the one thing I wish I had at the time was some way of speeding up the learning process and doing it the right way with less trial and error. It's been 14 years since I did any serious programming, but today back-end programming is often done with Python, SQL, and Go. And our sponsors, Boot.dev, have created a system for you to learn these and more from the ground up in a fun and intuitive way. Learning to program can open up a world of high paying jobs as a software developer or working for yourself to build up your own products and services. And that's the route which I took and believe me, it can be a life changing opportunity. Boot.dev takes you through the basics as you work your way through the examples to build real projects, gain the experience, points and achievements. This isn't some learn it in a week course. To become proficient takes time going deep into the theory and practice, and to do the whole curriculum takes around about 12 months. 
but you can do it in your own time and at your own pace. Don't worry about getting stuck. Boots, the AI bear wizard has been trained on every lesson and knows what you should be doing and sees where you go wrong and will guide you, but he won't give you the answers. You don't learn by just being handed it on a plate. It's free to create an account so you can read and watch in guest mode, but the paid membership opens up hands-on coding, AI assistance, progress tracking, and access to the boot.dev Discord community for real human assistance. Get started today by going to boot.dev and using my code CuriousDroid to get 25% off your entire first year on the annual plan. And it's also risk-free with a 30-day no quibble refund policy. The key for any cruise missile is navigation. It has to be able to be launched anywhere in the world and find its target autonomously. Of course, back before the mid 1980s, GPS didn't exist. The way the missile would find its way was through a combination of an inertial navigation system, INS, a terrain contour matching system, TURCOM, and for the final hitting of the target part, a digital scene matching area correlator or DSMAC. The accuracy of the inertial navigation system alone was good enough to get it near the target and for mid-course corrections. But for the longer the journey went on, the greater the error that occurred. That's just the way they worked as mechanical devices relying upon spinning gyroscopes. They were good, but not good enough to pinpoint a target up to 2,500 kilometers or 1,500 miles away. With an error of 0.01 degrees per hour, a flight of 1,000 kilometers could be out by up to 150 meters. So a two and a half thousand kilometer flight or 1500 miles, the error could be up to at least 375 meters, enough to miss the target completely. Though that might not be too much of a problem if it had a nuclear warhead. But all the Tomahawks that have ever been used had conventional warheads of 450 kilograms and thus required a much greater accuracy. So they backed it up with a terrain contour matching system or TURCOM. This would use digitized terrain maps, which the onboard computer would follow and then compare to the data from its onboard radar altimeter and make corrections along the way to compensate for those introduced by the inertial navigation system. Because it's following the terrain, it can stay very close to the ground to evade radar and its slim fuselage has a very low radar cross-section, which at very low altitudes makes it very difficult to detect even today. But why not just use TURCOM? Well, the problem was that flying across large bodies of water like lakes or the sea, there would be no useful terrain data, so it could get lost. So the INS would still be needed to point it in the right direction and TURCOM would check the fine course details to make sure that it got to the target correctly. However, what happens if you want to hit a specific building in a city or an industrial area or a bunker in the countryside, for example. This is where the final digital scene matching or the DSMAC comes in. This uses photographs of the target and the area around it and a camera in the missile. The camera then scans the ground as it travels along, looking for a match so that the missile would know where it was during its terminal phase. But this did have a weakness though. In areas of flat, open terrain with little visual detail like desert areas, the accuracy could be affected. For the anti-ship version, the Tomahawk used an active radar seeker rather than the TURCOM or DSMAC, which was derived from the Harpoon missile for sea skimming pop-up terminal attacks. These first generation Tomahawks were known as the Block 1s and entered operations in the early 1980s. The accuracy or the circular error probable of a Block 1 without the DSMAC was around 80 meters. But with the Block 2s with the DSMAC fitted, this dropped down to about 10 meters, making it the most accurate long range cruise missile in the world at the time. However, this meant that it relied upon up to date terrain maps and images of the target. Should any of that change, then the accuracy could be compromised. This information could take several days to prepare, so if a high value target were mobile, it could be too slow to respond. 
The first time tomahawks were used in combat was in the 1991 Operation Desert Storm. These were Block 2 versions but didn't yet have the GPS, but they proved to be very effective, taking out strategic target and air defense systems. Only tomahawks and the F-117s with laser-guided bombs were stealthy enough to attack the heavily defended targets in Baghdad, which was considered to have air defenses more formidable than those of any Eastern European target at the height of the Cold War. Tomahawks made up two-thirds of all the weapons used during the initial strike, with 106 being launched in the first wave and 290 in total for the duration of the conflict, and out of that, 242 hit their target. This is one of the reasons why in Operation Desert Storm they would follow routes chosen to avoid known air defense systems, radars, and in pre-GPS days, open areas of desert. In the initial attack, many flew to Iraq from Iran over the Zagros Mountains, which gave the systems a much better terrain relief to follow compared with the very straight, very flat, over the desert southern route from the Gulf. And it was a more unexpected route for the Iraqis to expect an attack to come from. This sent out a message to potential adversaries that this type of warfare by the Tomahawk cruise missile could be highly effective against even the best defended areas. The next big change came with the Block 3 version in 1994. This introduced jam resistant GPS and a new, more powerful control system to replace the old tank based green screen. The DSMAC was also upgraded to the DSMAC 2 to take in a greater area around the target to counter the issues they had seen in the flat deserts of Iraq. One of the benefits of the GPS upgrade was that it allowed three types of attack to be mounted. GPS only, for rapid mission planning down to just one hour, but with some reduced accuracy. DSMAC only, which would take longer to plan, but the terminal accuracy was somewhat better, but it took up to 80 hours of planning time. And the third was GPS aided missions, but combined with the DSMAC 2 to give the greatest overall accuracy, but longer planning than just GPS. GPS not only helped back up the other systems, it was added greater accuracy, with some reports saying that it was less than five meters, but officially it was still quoted less than 10 meters. The turbofan engine was also uprated to be 20% more efficient and 3% more powerful. GPS also allowed it to arrive at a particular time or to loiter over the target, waiting for other assets to arrive. The Block 3's first time in combat was the Bosnian War of 1993, when 13 were used to attack Bosnian Serb air defense systems. The Block 4 tactical Tomahawk missiles arrived in 2004, along with a raft of new capabilities and was the last major update. These were the first to be able to be reprogrammed whilst in flight via two-way satellite communications link to strike any of 15 pre-programmed alternate targets or redirect the missile to any GPS target coordinates. It could also send images back to the command base to assess damage from previous attacks, for example, so that it would be able to direct attacks against a new target if the existing one had been destroyed. It also had an updated anti-jamming version of GPS. Anti-jamming GPS systems use specially shaped antennas which form nulls in the signal reception but preserve the antenna's view of the GPS satellite while greatly reducing the effects of jamming signals. By 2020 and due to the importance of the Tomahawks had gained over the years, the US Navy started Block 5, which was a recertification and modernization program to keep it in service for the next 15 years. These included upgraded navigation and communications, a new seek ahead for the anti-ship version, which was able to hit moving ships, and a programmable joint multiple effects warhead system, JMU's warhead, which could be used against soft targets or hardened bunkers without the need to change the warhead. Now this is how the Tomahawk has managed to keep relevant for the last 49 years a constant program of updates to a modular design without having to rebuild a thing from scratch. There might well be new weapons like the hypersonic missiles and highly specialized missiles out there, but the extremely wide range of 
targeting coverage that the Tomahawk brings will keep it in use well into the 2040s. What has really been making a difference in how things might well move in the near future is the Ukrainian success in creating homegrown drones and now cruise missiles like the Flamingo for a fraction of the cost of traditional Western-made ones and in very short turnaround times. The big arms producers are already looking at how they can replicate the Ukrainian model to produce things like the Tomahawk, but at much lower costs and in much greater numbers. Although there are plans to replace the Tomahawk with the next generation land attack weapon, that isn't expected to be operational until at least 2028 to 2030. However, if this new ethos takes root quickly in the West, there might well be a lot of other new low-cost mass-produced weapons coming down the line in the not too distant future. So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you are then please thumbs up, share and subscribe and a big thank you goes to all of our patrons for the ongoing support.